Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, for those who are asking why there is no sound, we are just about to start. Uh, we were just giving a bit of leeway to allow our other participants to join us. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to be here for this uh, webinar. This is week one um, webinar on introduction to cybersecurity. It is a complimentary webinar in terms of um, the content that you've already interacted with uh, through the CTT course. And today we are joined by a guest speaker who is going to take us through some of the use cases of the knowledge that you've already learned during this particular week. And um, our guest speaker today is Lawrence. He's a cybersecurity operations center manager as well as a threat intelligence and digital forensic specialist. Uh, we have worked with him for quite some time and um, we're very grateful that he heeded the call to be with us here today and to share his wisdom on cybersecurity. So without much further ado, uh, Mr. Lawrence, you can proceed. Thank you so much, Patricia. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, and you are. visible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just be projecting my screen and uh, she'll be able to start. Uh, Patricia, please let me know once my screen is visible. Uh, we can now see your screen. Uh, just one more uh, housekeeping. Uh, if you do have questions about the content that you've interacted with during this particular week, or even during uh, Ms. Lawrence's presentation, please use the Q&A section, and we'll be able to answer those questions either on the Q&A section or live after his session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So I was going to introduce myself, but I think Patricia has done an amazing uh, job at it. So I'll jump straight into it. So it's an honor, a privilege to be part of this program and uh, to also share my experience uh, with uh, uh, cybersecurity and also my competencies. So I'll be covering introduction to uh, cybersecurity. So uh, before we start, uh, for the guys in Kenya, uh, last I checked, you guys were having a national uh, blackout. Our prayers uh, are with you. I hope you are. I hope you get fixed as much as I'm in Kenya. So yesterday, I come from a, a background, a family of teachers. I was talking with one of my siblings and uh, asking them. So when we talk of cybersecurity, uh, what comes to mind? Uh, she's a high school teacher, so I, I recall her telling me that, you know. These cybersecurity things, I hear you talk about, but I'm not really sure I understand what it is. So I asked him, okay, what are you most worried about when your students are interacting with the internet, with your phone, uh, on social media, TikTok, when doing research? And I, uh, she basically told me that I worry that whenever we give students assignment and they're going to do research on the internet, we expose them to a risk of running into adult content that might not be good for them. Now, given that she's a high school teacher, majority of her students are actually in that teenager age group where everyone is curious. So for her, her main concern was, can we safeguard or can she play a role in ensuring that her students don't get exposed to adult content, malicious content on the the internet, which was very interesting because uh, when I was talking now to my community of teachers, uh, the understanding of cybersecurity was uh, totally interesting, something I taken for granted that, well, everyone knows what cybersecurity is. So I'm hoping uh, in today's session, I will be able to shed more light on uh, cybersecurity in whole, the various uh, domains it has and how they impact us and how they, the role they play in our day-to-day -day life. So starting off with just basic definition of what cybersecurity is. 
it's the practice of defending one computers servers uh, servers are computers that run most of your applications so for example if you're accessing TikTok, if you're accessing Facebook, you're accessing your email address, you're accessing your school timetabling system, the student management system, you're accessing Zoom, all of them are running on a server somewhere. So practice of defending computer servers, mobile devices, electronic systems and networks and data from malicious attacks and actors. So when you talk of malicious attacks and actors, uh, we mean or we are referring to anyone who might be accessing your computers, your servers, your mobile devices. These all these system and networks with the intention uh, of doing something bad on them to either personally benefit them and uh, undermine everyone else who uses that particular uh, system. Now, in addition to cybersecurity, we also have its cousin, very closely related, called information security. I say they are cousins because they share a lot. One, all of them focus on the practice of defending from uh, defending certain things from malicious actors and uh, attacks. The main difference between cybersecurity and information security is that information security is more concerned about information in general. Now, this information can be in the servers that you have talked about, can be in your personal computers, it can be in your tablet, your laptop. Also, this information can also be in your office filing cabinets. It can also be in that amazing notebook you have. So information security is more broader and at times even encompasses cybersecurity. Well, cybersecurity on the other hand, typically focuses on systems and networks, basically the things in the electronic uh, sphere or domain. However, not to worry, most of us, most of the professionals actually use information security and cybersecurity interchangeably. But if you're interested in knowing that particular subtle nuance difference, uh, that's usually uh, the difference. So <clears throat> when we talk of cybersecurity, cybersecurity has a rebuilding block. When you are defending all these systems against malicious attacks and actors, uh, we are doing so to satisfy three main requirements. And these are what we typically call the CIA triad. The CIA triad stands for one, the C stands for confidentiality, the I integrity, and the A availability. So what do we mean when we talk or say confidentiality? I'll pose a question to all of us in the school uh, setup, even in your personal setup, we all have sets of pieces of information that will only be accessible either by yourself, you or the school department or specific groups or categories of people. So how do you know who should access that information and how do you enforce and ensure that, for example, uh, the school reports, uh, students' performance reports are only accessible by one, the class teacher and uh, maybe the head of department or a student's personal performance report is only accessible by that student alone and not the entire school. Your answer to those questions is actually you trying to enforce or you trying to satisfy the confidentiality aspect of a cybersecurity. So confidentiality is all about securing and ensuring that systems, information, and data is only accessible to the right user. So for example, the exams will only be accessible to specific set of a specific group of users and not everyone. The fact that they're accessible to only a specific set of people, you actually say that these exams are 
confidential. So cyber security, when you talk of cyber security, specifically confidentiality, uh, that's what we mean. Then moving from confidentiality, we also have uh, integrity. Integrity deals or concerns it, itself in ensuring that the information you receive is actually the correct and right information and it's not been altered or it's not been changed. So for example, I know any student out there will want to have access to the grading system. And if they have underperformed, they'll want to change that information. Now as a student, uh, as a teacher, or even as a trainer myself, we always want to ensure that the grading we offer or the grading we input into the system does not change, does not get tampered with. Now, th that whole process of ensuring that what you have entered into the system has not been tampered with is uh, integrity, is us trying to satisfy this cybersecurity aspect of uh, uh, integrity. Then moving on from integrity, we go to availability. Now, imagine <clears throat> first day in school, all the students are reporting and uh, your learning management system or the timetabling system is not accessible. If it's hosted on a laptop or you access it via the browser, it's not accessible. Or even to bring this at home. Imagine you clicked on the Zoom link to access this uh, session and uh, you are told that uh, this link is no longer available or uh, Zoom cannot be accessible. Now, the fact that Zoom was, wasn't accessible, the fact that the timetabling or the learning management system is not accessible, that affects availability. So in cybersecurity, availability concerns or deals with ensuring that these systems you're working are actually available when required. So you want to enter student information, that system has to be available. Uh, you want to access a Zoom meeting, a Google Meet class session, the platform you're using has to be available. So when we talk of cybersecurity, when you are defending against these malicious attackers or these malicious actors, what we are actually defending, what you're actually protecting is the confidentiality, the integrity, and the availability. These malicious attacks or actors, what they are concerned sorry, what they are concerned with is undermining confidentiality, undermining integrity, and undermining availability uh, of systems. So just throwing in additional examples, I believe during COVID and even post uh, pre-COVID, a lot of institutions or some institutions were actually using learning management platforms, uh, during COVID and post-COVID, a lot more institutions have onboarded additional learning and student management systems. So how is cybersecurity achieved from that particular context? Uh, I'm 100% sure that if you try to log on to access your learning management system or your student management system, your IT team has provided you with the Either I use actually both a username and a password. You are given this to ensure that only the right people have access to that particular system. And by doing this, what are they trying to do? They're trying to ensure confidentiality, trying to ensure that only people who should have access actually have access. When you try to access Zoom, you try to access uh, even Gmail, Google Meet, on the browser, we always are advised that, or you always look for that green padlock on your browser. If that green padlock is not there, then your connection to that service is not secure. What that green padlock is trying to also achieve is confidentiality and integrity, because the green padlock tells you that it is that indeed you are communicating with that particular uh, platform or that particular student manage management portal. Then additionally, all of these systems will have different roles and uh, permission. So for example, 
as a teacher, if you're logging into uh, the learning management system, you have a role, uh, you probably have a role as an instructor. As an instructor, you are given privileges that the student uh, doesn't have. So for example, you are able to see all your students, their performance, you're able to assess them, you're able to give assignments. On the other hand, the student, when he logs into that platform, in most cases, he'll be, he or she or they will be able to see only their performance and tasks that have been assigned to them. What this platform are doing and what has been inbuilt into them is what you have talked about, the CIA triad, by ensuring that the student can only see what they're meant to see. The student can't make an authorized changes onto the platform. And on the other hand, instructors are also given additional privileges and it goes further in that probably one instructor might not be able to see performance or records for another student out there then also what else is done backup of information so periodically all of this system will actually pick some if not all of information and store them somewhere for safekeeping now, what backup does is that if any of this system actually goes down or if any of this system for some technical reasons or human error becomes unavailable, you can't access them, then your IT team is able to get this particular backup and restore the system to a manner that is now accessible to the end user and essentially achieving what we call or what you have mentioned availability. Now, as much as these concepts are also tied, are tied to learning and student management systems, they also cut across our personal spaces and uh, our personal uh, domain. I'm sure uh, if I'll, I'll use uh, WhatsApp uh, as a case study. We do back up our WhatsApp status so that if your phone is damaged, stolen, misplaced, it's easy for you to access the phone. We go a step further and add authentication into our, our WhatsApp account so that if I want to access WhatsApp, I need to enter a PIN or need to enter uh, a fingerprint just to ensure that only the right people will have access to your WhatsApp chats and uh, communication. So going to video conferencing system, Zoom and Google, all of them require you to have a link in order to access them. What is this doing? It's ensuring uh, confidentiality. You will not be able to access this training if, you're not, if you do not have uh, the right link. Additionally, they also give us the ability to add passcode for more security. So in addition to password, in addition to having the link, there are additional uh, controls, there are additional features, additional steps you can actually take to increase your cybersecurity. The main thing for you to understand is what are you protecting yourself against? The confidentiality, integrity, and availability. With that in mind, then as teachers, as trainers, you're always creative. We figure out ways of, with all these resources we have, with all this information I have, what can I do to attain confidentiality? What an additional step can I do to attain more integrity? What additional steps can I do to attain more uh, availability? Actually, a good case for availability that I've seen, uh, I also have my partner is also a teacher. So for all the notes she has for her students, she always sends them to me via WhatsApp. It's, uh, it can be borderline interesting, I used to honestly used to get annoyed at one point, like, why are you sending me too many chats of your notes, your notes? And then I realized that I've also been doing the exact same thing with her. So what you're trying to do in our own creative way is actually achieving availability so that if her phone, her laptop, her device is broken down, her notes are not lost. She can go back to her WhatsApp and I can she can actually retrieve her notes or I can forward it to her colleagues or someone else and she can get that. 
then are still on video conferencing, we are talking of multiple data centers. So companies like Google, or Facebook, Zoom will have data centers, which are basically very huge houses with a lot of servers that facilitate you having access to Zoom. So when you have multiple data center, it basically means that if you have a data center in region A, if region A cannot uh, has a power outage like what you're having in Kenya, region B, which has another data center, is able to ensure availability. Then of course, we have a backup of information that we have talked about. So <clears throat> from a personal level, what can you do? How can cybersecurity be achieved from a personal level? As I've mentioned, one, just knowing the CIA triad and figuring out additional things you can do to satisfy it. Secondly, attending training like this, where we get to share experiences, we get to share knowledge, we get to collaborate and have a discussion. Then secondly, or thirdly, you can also use strong and unique passwords on your account. So strong and unique passwords on social media, on your email, on your school platform, so on and so forth. Uh, I know we will have a session uh, in the course of this training where we dive more in regards to having strong and unique passwords. Then regularly updating your phones, computers, and app. I'm sure that if you're using an Android system, Android phone, an iPhone, you are typically told that the phone has to update itself. There's a new update. From a personal point of view, you want to be regularly updating your phone, your computers, and those applications. Then also having an antivirus will go a long way in also ensuring that uh, your personal cybersecurity is, uh, is achieved. If you're using a learning management system, a student management system, any uh, application or platform in your school, in your organization, your IT admin or your IT team is actually doing this in the background. You can have actually a sit down with them or just ask them, how are you maintaining cybersecurity aspect of this particular platform you're using? And in most cases, they will be more than happy to shed light on what they're doing. Now, some emerging concepts in cybersecurity. One of the most emerging, one actually one big concept that is actually emerging is privacy. So more and more countries are enacting laws to protect privacy of users. So which means right now in most countries, you actually need consent from the user to be able to collect and store their data. You need to define how you'll actually use that particular data and how long you're actually going to keep it. Now these users, are not only adults, it also includes minors. Uh, depending on your region, we have different legislation. So for example, in India, uh, we have the India Personal Data Protection Bill. In the EU, we have the General Data Protection Regulation. Then for Canada, we have the Digital Charter, uh, Charter Implementation Act. For Nigeria, we have uh, the Nigeria Data Protection Regulation. Other countries, probably a country might have something already in the work or a legislation that is uh, already existing. Now, why privacy is important is that this regulation actually imposes fine if you violate the, prince, the privacy principle, uh, principle. So if you are collecting data and you're not asking, explicitly asking uh, the students or whoever you're collecting information about consent, you might find yourself running into a legal challenge and fines will be imposed. Uh, this is not only limited to the private sector, but actually schools. I'm actually reminded of a very good example in the US where I believe during COVID, due to uh, re that whole remote experience, we had a proctored exam. And this proctored exam, you had students being told that put on your camera on so that we can see and ensure that you're not engaging in exam irregularities. And a student actually took, I think in the US, they are called school districts. 
he took the school district to court and uh, I think the case was about his complaint was that his privacy rules or his privacy was being violated and proctoring and forcing him to put his video on was actually violating his uh, privacy. And uh, it was actually in violation of uh, the state's privacy regulation. And the school district was put to task to actually explain how they were complying with the uh, privacy regulations and requirement. Unfortunately, the school and the platform the school was using to proctor the exam could not prove, uh, we, uh, I think it is uh, within reasonable doubt, that they, were actual, they actually had the means processes to protect that student's privacy and the student won. So this is just to show you how privacy now is becoming a big issue. Now, something else to note about privacy is that <clears throat> minors cannot give consent. In most cases, you need to, to work and get consent through the parents. So as teachers, as educators, it's always good for us to be aware of this and know how best we can work within existing regulations to ensure that we are also complying with the, uh, the various regulations. Uh, another emerging concept is a ransomware attacks. So a ransomware attack is where a threat actor gains access to your school computers and makes the information you have in those computers inaccessible and they then demand to be paid a ransom to make that information accessible. So for example, you wake up one day, you go to the school and you realize that you cannot access any computers, any of the information system that school cannot be accessible. So one, you cannot access uh, the learning management system. You cannot access the time uh, timetabling system. You cannot access your email address. Not only you, but the students cannot access that. Then later on, the IT team will tell you that. In most cases, they'll tell you that we are under a ransomware attack. So what will happen, what will have happened in that case is that that threat actor or malicious actor has made information inaccessible to everyone, but only accessible to them. And they demand to be paid to share with you the secrets to make that information accessible. So for context, only last year, ransomware affected 1,043 schools across 62 school districts and 26 colleges and universities. This statistics is only for the US. Now, out of these sensitive data from employees and students were stolen and released online. So in addition to your ability to teach being in convenience, then you have sensitive data about students and employees being shared online, which puts you in a very delicate bad place with the, the privacy regulations. So those are two emerging issues that we should be aware of and uh, basically have the assurance that uh, the various people we are working with uh, are taking the right and necessary controls or steps to reduce them. So as we wrap this up, what happens if you experience a cybersecurity issue. So you experience a ransomware, you experience privacy. Specifically for privacy, the term we use is data breach. What happens when you experience a data breach? Meaning that data that was meant to be confidential is no longer confidential and has been accessed by people who are not meant to have access. So, or even you are working machine or even a student phone becomes exposed to the uh, a malware or a virus, what can you do? One, if you have an IT team, report that issue to them, they will be able to help you. Most countries also have what we call national computer and emergency response team and centers. Uh, these teams are tasked with actually helping the country and the various stakeholder respond to cybersecurity issues and incidents. Additionally, to the National Computer Emergency Response Team or centers, we also have what we call sectarial SATs. So these sectarial SATs are tasked with 
handling specific stakeholders. So in your country, even if you talk to your uh, IT team, they will be able to point you to the right sector SAT specifically for education that is tasked with liaising with the education stakeholders to ensure that their cybersecurity issues are handled. In addition to handling cybersecurity issues, SATs also give periodic user awareness uh, trainings that is friendly for different uh, user domains. So they'll give awareness that is specific to private sector, govern, government sector, NGO, and all that. If you are working with a sector SAT, then they'll give information that is very specific to the education sector. They can come giving training and even facilitate and increase your cybersecurity awareness. Now, if that issue is tied to a specific software application or platform, you can always report that issue to the respective support team of that particular software application. So for example, Zoom, Google, if you are using application like Blackboard or Moodle, all of them have support teams that are on the ready and willing to help you with any cybersecurity issues you might have. Then, so as I come to an end, I'm hoping the brief uh, couple of slides I've shared have been able to give you a good overview, brief in regards to cybersecurity, why we are doing what you are doing, uh, why it's important, and if you are ever affected, who you need to contact or talk to, and just generally information you need to be aware of when you talk over a cyber a security. With that, I would like to end my session and thank you, uh, thank everyone and a hand over at the program back to our moderator. Uh, thank uh, you Patricia. very much, Lawrence. Um, thank you. Yes, yeah, I am. Uh, thank you very much for that very insightful presentation. Uh, we appreciate you for being here and to our participants as well for joining the session. Uh, so we do have a couple of questions and I would also like to encourage uh, the participants, if you do have a question you'd like to ask our, um, our guest speaker today, please do share it in the Q&A and we'll be able to answer you in the next um, Q&A session that we are doing right now. So there are a couple of questions uh, so far. And um, I would like for Lawrence to take this one. Uh, so there's, uh, Sadiq asks that, um, my question is, can we use uniform password for our devices and accounts? If not, what best thing can we do in order to handle and secure our devices and accounts easily, since most of the platforms would, uh, require strong passwords? Uh, thank you for that. Let me just see if... I might be able to go back to the slides. So in one of the slides, we mentioned using unique, strong password. It's not recommended, I believe you're here. It's not recommended for you to use a common password because what happens with a common password is that if Patricia and I are sharing a password and for some reasons, Patricia's password gets exposed. It also means that I'm also exposed because we are sharing that single password. So if you are able to access Patricia's email address and you know my email address or you know my account, then it's game over. You gain access because we are sharing a password. So how do you create a strong password? And as I mentioned, not to preempt the remaining session, but we do have a, a, what we call password management tools that help you with the process of creating a this strong password. So what a password management tool does for you is that it will automatically generate that password for you, associate that password with, with that specific service that you're using for that, that particular moment. moment. For, so for example, it will generate a password for my Facebook account. The next time I try, I go create an account on uh, Zoom, it will create a unique password on Zoom. Now, 
the beauty or the efficiency of password manager here is that I don't require to recall all of this password. The next time I'm going to log into Zoom, the password manager itself will autofill my Zoom password for me. Next time I'm logging into Facebook, it will autofill that password for me. Question here we get often, we get often is that, so how then does this password manager protect my password? How it achieves this is by, instead of you remembering all these passwords, you only remember one master password. So when you access your laptop, when you access your browser, the password manager will ask you to enter your master password and ask and will even prompt you, how long do you want me to remember this master password? By default, some will only have five minutes. So as long as you have entered that master password, the next time I try to log into any platform, that password manager will automatically enter the password in for me. And you can sync this across all your devices. So you download the password manager, I install it onto my work machine, I sign in, I install it into my phone, I sign in. So whenever, I want to access any service as long as I have that password manager, it will do the heavy listing for me. And that is the easiest way to remove using common password and introduce strong and unique password. I hope that answers the question that has been raised. All right, thank you very much, Lawrence, for that answer. Um, during week three, we'll also look at uh, passwords again. And so um, you'll get to understand how to use strong passwords and what exactly constitutes those uh, strong passwords. So um, I'm glad we've started this conversation already about uh, strong passwords because it's very important, especially because of how many accounts these days we have and um, all of them do require unique passwords all through. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, uh, so we have another question on how can I set my computers so that my students cannot get access to other sites? So this is a really good question, Cynthia. And one of the ways in which you can do this is through the inbuilt firewall that most computers come with. And um, by using the, the firewall, you're able to enter various sites that you would want blocked. And so that allows you to universally <clears throat> prevent people that are using those devices from accessing certain sites. Um, should you need further guidance, you can also send us an email so that we can share with you some resources on or rather the step, um, the step by step way of of actually enabling that, and then you can be able to pro, uh, prevent your students from accessing other sites. All right, let me see other questions that we have. Um, there are a lot of questions about the webinar recording and the slides. After this, once the recording is ready, we will actually share it with you as well as um, share the slides from our presenter today. So you will have those sent to you via email. Uh, so be on the lookout for that as well. The next question is um, again to our facilitator. Um, it's, could you please briefly recapture the emerging concepts in cybersecurity? Ah, sure. So the emerging concepts are I mentioned, I mentioned two that uh, have uh, the highest uh, impact. One, privacy. So as I, we talked, I uh, mentioned before, is that right now, a lot of countries, uh, let me actually see if I can share my screen uh, for anyone who wants to pick links from there. So as we mentioned before, our countries right now are uh, coming up with uh, legislations that are aimed to specifically safeguard the privacy of end users. Now let me see where is it. Okay, here we go. So <clears throat> these legislations were not there 10 or five years ago, not that widespread, but right now, they're actually there. And most of this legislation 
require you to explicitly ask for consent. So for example, right now, if you go to most website, they'll give you the cookie bar and tell you that this is the, the information they are collecting about you and even give you the option to uh, decline or refuse certain information about you to be collected. That's due to this privacy regulation. So now, as long as you're collecting user data, you are required, especially if your country has law, privacy laws that have been passed, you will be required to one, get user consent to collect the information and store the information and process that particular information. So for example, we are, we are collecting student uh, information. And uh, just to add on here, this information is usually PII. It's called PII information, information that can be used to identify that particular person. So these will be their names, surname, first name, last name, their ID number, social security number, their phone numbers, so on and so forth. So if you are collecting PII information, you are required to get consent from that user that they actually indeed agree for you to collect that PII data, store that data and process that data. If you're storing that data, if you're collecting it and processing, you are required to also tell them what kind of operations, actions you'll be doing on that data. So if you are collecting my username, you are meant to tell me clearly that I'm collecting your username in order to facilitate A, B, C, and D. Then additionally, you should be able to define how long you're going to store that particular data and any other user you're going to use for that data. Generally, this privacy law revolve around that. However, they slightly vary. So recommendation is always to read the privacy laws that apply to your organization best to satisfy them. Now, with that said, additionally, as much as we have these uh, country level policies, uh, sectors, also typically have their own policies. So for example, for a very long time, doctors have always had a doctor patient privilege before privacy laws were introduced. Uh, attorneys have always had attorney client, client privileges before these laws uh, were introduced. In the education sector, I've not come across any specific regulations that govern what the school, parents, educators, teachers, how they interact with each other, but it's always good to consult with your school administrators and see whether you actually have any privacy laws in that regard, because it will influence how you process, collect that particular uh, information. Then lastly, we also mentioned that minors typically cannot give consent and that consent has to be sourced through uh, their parents. Then lastly, we talked over ransomware attacks where we basically mentioned that uh, a ransomware attack is an attack where a malicious actor gains access to your school information systems. So if you, if you are uh, in a school with a uh, hundreds of laptops, workstation servers and all that, at an attacker might again access there, install softwares that will make all the information or specific information in that system inaccessible to you. Now, if that information system is not accessible and given that you are living in the digital world, for example, I know in my school, everything that we do for the last two years uh, is computer-based. I'm accessing a learning platform somewhere. I'm accessing my courses. I'm uh, sharing training materials. So imagine a school of uh, 3,000 people and they can't access their computer systems. Students will start being uncomfortable. Panic will ensue. Uh, reputational uh, damage starts kicking in 
depending on your regulator, you might be fined. So ransomware attacks are actually meant to make you be scared of these things in a manner that once you have been attacked, you are actually forced to pay that ransomware to make to make them avail that information uh, back to you. May, something just to note here is that even personally, you can be a victim a victim of ransomware. I recall what uh, 10, 15 years ago, uh, when I was uh, still in a primary and high school, we had very few teachers who had computers. And uh, I remember actually our chemistry teacher spent a lot of time coming up with classes, amazing PowerPoint slides to illustrate chemical reactions. So imagine him having invested three years doing amazing, uh, very engaging PowerPoints, then he gets infected with ransomware. Those slides are gone and he's told, okay, give us a uh, thousand US dollars and we'll give you back your five years, 10 years worth of work or this work is done. Now it's not a school being affected, but it's now an individual being affected. So ransomware attack can cut across both an individual sphere and also an institutional or organizational sphere. I hope that answers the question that was raised. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, for covering it very comprehensively. Um, so some of the questions are also being answered um, through typed text. Uh, so you could also check the answered um, slot to see whether your question was already answered um, by some of our facilitators. Um, we do have a lot of questions. We'll not get to all of them, but we will we will actually create a document and answer all these questions together and share it together with the recording and the slides for this session. Uh, so if your question is not answered here, uh, we will be able to answer it offline and send the document to you. So I think we do have room for three other questions. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll pass this one to our facility, uh, to our guest speaker because he won't be there for the offline question and a answer a question and answer session. So um, there's a question on, so after, after you've received information from organizations that your data has been compromised, what should be done? Ha, good question. So <clears throat> If you receive data that in your, if you basically get notification that your data has been compromised, one, if your country already has a, a data protection act, those acts typically outline the next step you should do from a regulatory point uh, point of view. So this might include one, notifying the regulator that you had your data compromised, especially if this data was for the school and even for minors. Additionally, once you've satisfied the regulator's requirement, they will also follow up. You might also want to engage, you remember you talked of uh, the computer emergency response teams, you also might want to engage them, especially if you do not have the technical capacity to do the investigation and try to recover the data. So you might also want to engage them and take advantage of the technical facilities and services they offer. Now, most importantly, I should have actually started with this. If you have an IT team, talk to them, tell them that this is a what has happened and they will be able to advise you. So for example, in cases of ransomware, we have some of these ransomwares that actually have what we call decryption keys, or they have a piece, a magic key that uh, if you have it, you are able to gain or get that information that was previously inaccessible. So if you have an information data breach disclosure, you want to recover information, talk to the relevant IT, your IT team, if you're in a school, uh, the IT team, if you're in a school, they will be able now to pick this up with the regulator 
with the sector SAT or the national SAT. As an individual, you can still make a request directly to the national SAT. And in most cases, from experience, they might delay, but they will reach out uh, to you. So uh, I hope that uh, offers some light and answers uh, uh, the question that was raised. Uh, thank you once again for that very comprehensive answer. Um, there is another question on how often can you change the master password on um, on your password manager? Or generally, how often should you change passwords? Would you like to take this one as well? Oh, yes. So <clears throat> how often you should change password is a very the answer can be very political. Uh, we have international standards that actually define how often you should change the password. And one of them is called uh, NIST, uh, NIST, N I S T. It's an American uh, standardization body that is globally used to as a baseline for cybersecurity issues. So, what NIST recommends is that you should only change your password if it's been compromised. And I'll explain why that, that might be important. If you change password continuously, remember the master password is meant to be a very unique password, a very strong and unique password. So instead of remembering 10 passwords, you are just remembering one password. And they'll even go ahead and say, instead of using passwords, use passphrase. So a passphrase can be a sentence, it can be a statement in uh, your preferred language, can be in, your in, in English or native. I prefer passphrase, which are native languages, because they're hard to crack. So in that regard, if you're using a passphrase, which is meant to be very strong, then standards of bodies like NIST actually recommend that you should only change it once you feel that it's been compromise. This ensures that you are not changing your passwords or passphrase very regularly, which forces your body to start remembering more pa passwords after a very short period of time, which eventually will lead to you making, making weak and insecure passwords or passphrase. So there's that approach. The other approach where if you prefer changing passwords, I will recommend to be changing your password or passphrase at least once every three months. Every three months, change your passwords. Though I've seen other guys going for six months or guys and respectable people in the cybersecurity industry changing their passwords every once a year. The main underlying principle is usually they are either changing their passwords because they feel it might have been compromised or breached, or they're just changing it because of a best practice. So they, I don't think there is a silver or a, a straight answer, but what I know is you don't want to be changing your password every week or every month. After every three months, as long as it's a secure password, it's not shared anywhere, it is unique, you will be okay. Absolutely, I actually agree as well. Uh, you should change your passwords when you feel they have been compromised. Um, you should not change them very often because, because, um, because we have times where uh, we have times where people will try to keep on changing their passwords and then they end up they end up. Um, using the same password and repeating the same passwords all over because um, they have just been told, keep on, you know, just keep on changing the password every three months or so. And we end up reusing a lot of the passwords that we have. So um, I'm of the opinion that, um, I'm of the opinion that we should only change passwords when uh, we feel they have been compromised and also, if you think they're weak passwords, you should definitely change those. If it's something that can be easily predicted, 
um, you should actually uh, change them to make sure that you're using strong and unique passwords. Uh, uh, but Patricia, again, yes. Uh, sorry to cut you short. Uh, I just okay. maybe something to add. Uh, All right. uh, we talked about updating browsers application. So right now, if you're using Chrome, if you're using Firefox, if you're using Edge, and uh, if you can't have, if you don't have a password manager and you're using password managers that come with the browser, browsers nowadays can actually notify you whether your password has actually been used or has actually been compromised. So you also want to take advantage of those facilities and features that are coming up with modern browsers that are actually meant to notify you and make you more secure. Uh, Patricia, back to you. All right, thank, thank you for that addition. Uh, maybe we can take one more question and um, I would like Linda to take this one. Uh, so someone asked um, on how, when we are accessing things online, how is it that we can avoid ads? So how can we avoid ads while we are browsing? And Linda, are you in a position to answer the question? Uh, yes, yes, Patricia, I can I, I can take that question. Um, uh, nowadays things are easy. You just download ad blockers. Uh, they are, these are add-ons on, on a browser. You install them on your browser. And once you install them, they'll be able to block any unnecessary ads uh, while you're browsing or or while you are online. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Or Patricia, you can add on something else. Absolutely. Thank you for answering the question, Linda. And yes, um, enabling these add-ons or extensions to your browser can really help you. And uh, we also recommend the use of browsers that actually do this by default. And uh, there's a browser known as Brave, and it's a really good um, browser that enables you to avoid being tracked online and it protects your own privacy and blocks all ads by default. And so it's a really good um, browser that we can recommend for your online activities. All right, uh, let's see whether we have any more questions that we can handle right now. All right, there's one. Um, seeing that we need many different online accounts for different reasons, is it advisable to use a suggested strong password to save our passwords on our browsers for future use? So for example, like Chrome browser, it always has that feature for saving passwords on the browser. Uh, Lawrence? Uh, sure. So if you don't have access to a password manager and a Chrome, the inbuilt password manager is all you have, then it's better than nothing. So by all means, you can use that strong suggested password that will be suggested or recommended by whichever browser you are using. However, as you are doing that, what you want to do uh, is also ensure that that password manager inbuilt in the browser is password protected. So for example, uh, not for example, actually, both Chrome, Bra uh, Chrome, uh, we have talked of Brave, uh, Firefox, Edge, all of them allow, all of them will auto-suggest strong passwords for you. And all of them will save passwords for you. And they give you an ability to save or store those saved password with a master password. Now, why is this important? If you are only, if you are just using the suggested passwords, which is good, it, uh, it however introduces a risk to you in that if you, if your machine, your laptop get accessed by anyone, it can be your students, a colleague at work, someone in malicious intent, they will be able to go to your saved passwords and see those saved passwords. However, if you have, you are using a master password to password protect your saved password, if anyone has access to those passwords, they will still require to input that master password 
for you to be for them to be able to access those same password. So just to reiterate, if you don't have an alternative, then you can use uh, the browser in build uh, password manager. But if you have an alternative of using password managers that are specifically designed as password managers and not extension of browser functionalities, then you want to opt for them first because they have been known and proven to store your passwords more securely compared to those uh, browser-based uh, password managers. I, I hope uh, that uh, offers clarity and answers uh, the question that was asked. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, we'll answer one last question and then we'll close uh, the webinar. Uh, but all these questions that are here will also be answered and sent to you. Uh, so there's a question on what is a VPN and how is it as a security feature? Kindly sweep through the term in matters of accessing online information. So generally a VPN is a virtual private network and it is mostly used when we are accessing information via untrusted networks. So for example, um, you're at the airport and you're using airport Wi-Fi, which can actually be very, um, you can be very vulnerable to an attack when you're using untrusted networks, networks that have not been very well Protected. And so maybe your data can actually be seen uh, by anyone who might sniff on it or eavesdrop on it. And so a VPN makes uh, creates a protected or an encrypted channel where your data will be sent over the internet, uh, preventing any malicious um, middlemen from seeing that particular data. Um, it can be quite um, a concept to learn, and I would um, advise you to either reach out to us and we'll provide, we'll guide you to resources that you can actually learn from, uh, but it's generally a security feature in terms of accessing um, private information when you're using very public networks. So basically, that is what a VPN is. All right, uh, so thank you very much uh, for joining us for this webinar. We, uh, I believe we've all learned something uh, from Mr. Lawrence. Uh, to Mr. Lawrence, thank you so much for joining us today. We had a lovely time. We enjoyed your presentation and thank you for staying on as well to answer the questions that our participants had. Um, just to reiterate, all the slides, the slides and the recording and the questions that were asked here today will be sent to you via email and we'll also share on the on the telegram group as well uh, so please be on the lookout there and you'll be able to receive these um these documents thank you so much enjoy the rest of your day